Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show today. We're going to talk about home fermentation, lacto fermentation, and the benefits of it. As well as hugel culture. Is it right for you? And what even is hugel culture? Yeah. As well as questions from social media and callers that are listening to the program right now. And that all starts now. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether through those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the uh, website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, or anywhere in between. We are live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Beside me, I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com is your destination for all things gardening, now containing over 1,000 garden videos Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and a whole lot more. And this show is made possible by the great sponsors you'll hear throughout the program. And just like... Nasala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because it was not Nasala Kombucha. It's not kombucha. You can find out more at nasala.com. And there's a number of ways in which you can contact us right here during the show and after the show. You can do that uh, during the show on the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline. Ivy Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents. Protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces. For use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. The Ivy Organic Hotline is 414-444-5250. You don't have to wait to the end of the show to give us a call if you've got a garden question. You can also email us at twvgradio at gmail.com anytime that you've got a question. You can also hashtag TWVG. Now, if you've got a question about, hey, what is wrong with my plant, um, add a photograph to that email or that tweet and that really helps us on our end to identify what that is because we all have a lot of problems but the description is good photographs even better well i want to welcome those we were at the mequon public library yep thursday on thursday on the holly's basics of canning class and we want to welcome those who attended that class now are listening to the program as well as yesterday we were at the wisconsin state fair at the well it's not the horticultural building anymore isn't it or what, what's the title of it or i think it's the grand champion building it's known as the horticultural building across from the, expo, across from the expo center uh we were there we were talking on uh growing great garlic we will be there again this afternoon four o'clock so you can stop in see see us learn a bit about growing garlic and um then come this thursday we will be at the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Thursday at 6 p.m., where you will be talking, Holly, about... I'll be talking about basics of canning as well. There must be a hot topic in the <laughs> late summer, right? Yes, so. Uh, so you'll be there, and that's free. All of these are free. I mean, you got to get in the state fair to do your own thing, but you can come see us for free. So uh, we hope to see you somewhere along the lines. And uh, with that being said, uh, we're going to cover today a topic that a lot of people are not that familiar with, or or they're familiar with it for maybe the wrong perception. Ferment, not, fermentation. Not the wrong perception. Well, I think just what they what they know. Okay, fermentation to the average person, fermentation you would think wine or beer. Right. Typically. Typically, mm -hmm. but there is a whole other realm of fermentation that is good for your gut and all that health benefits that you can do with vegetables you're getting out of the garden right now or you're buying fresh from the farmer's market. Right. So let's so let's go over what what is fermentation? So let's, let's well first there might be some you might know of some common commonly fermented foods that you may not be aware of that you are eating on a regular, eating basis. On a regular basis and that typically is sauerkraut that's a you know Wisconsin favorite with your brat your polish or whatever you're eating and then um, kimchi a lot of people like kimchi it's becoming more popular and yogurt those are commonly fermented um, things and you can do all of those in your kitchen if you have the right tools and and you understand the procedure right but we were not going to get really into the procedure process of it. we're going to explain the the some of the other things that go right. along with it so fermentation is it consists of uh, transformation of simple raw materials into a range of value-added products with the utilization of the phenomenon of growth of micro microorganisms and their activities on various substrates so basically lacto fermentation is a micro microbial process using beneficial bacteria 
including uh, lactobacillus, which is a popular, well-known one. A lot of times if you look at your yogurt, it'll say lactobacillus. On and these it. are beneficial. Right, beneficial bacteria. And other lactid, lactic acid bacteria, which is also known as LAB, which is the probiotics, which thrive in an, in an anaerobic fermenting environment. Okay, well, let's, let, let, okay, anaerobic. That means lack of oxygen? Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Basically, that's what So it you're is. cutting off the oxygen to allow it to break down on itself to do the fermentation. Right. But you're also, it's also picking up the bacteria from the air as well. So it's that's kind of. in that container. But it's the yeah. good, it's the good bacteria. So you're letting the good bacteria work for you. Okay. Now I do want to make people aware that if you do go venture on doing fermentation, you're going to have some there, there's going to be problems. You're going to have some fermentation procedures not come out right. Right. And I want to say that if you see mold on any of your fermented situations, you definitely don't cut don't it off, don't pour it, don't right. take that part out and eat the rest. Get rid of the whole deal, start completely start over. over. Yeah. Because there's and something that uh, did not jive right during that procedure. And you want, you want to start small, or you could also take a class. Like I took a class through the Milwaukee Rec Department um, about fermentation, and they, I believe the fall, yeah, the fall catalog is out now, so you can take a look. I don't know if there's any classes listed there or not, but that's definitely something to look into. We've done anything from, um, well, isn't what a, we, Isn't what fermentation we, just like basically the pickles in the crock? Isn't that a, a level yeah, of fermentation? Yeah. It, it's not really pickling. Well, it's pickling. It's, it's, it's a different type of pickling. Versus putting in the jar in the water bath can or that type of thing. So if you had a mom or a grandma or whoever that did pickles in the crock, that's a, a type of fermentation. And that's a technique in itself. That there, There's a little more technique to that than just putting them in a jar of water bath and sealing them up and let them set on the shelf. Right. Okay. Now, what what is is, is it pretty much anything that we can ferment or is there limitations to, I mean, uh, vegetable-wise? Obviously, you're not probably... well. You know, we're not going to get into the fermentation of like fish and meat and stuff like that. No, that's that's kind of different. But there are cultures that do that and do that very very successfully. Right. We just never practice that level. So people do things like fermented salsas. They do fermented um, different spreads. You know, chop up their vegetables, let them ferment. There's a vegetable mix that's very popular in Chicago. I can't think of it. It has. Um, it's like an Italian mix, usually with cauliflower, peppers, uh, cucumbers, and that's people will make that fermented. Okay. Um, so there's different things that you can do. Basically, what you're doing is you're making a brine with water and salt, and that combination will help preserve the food and encourage it to last longer and also get that fermented quality. And then you're adding different spices as well. Now, when you're fermenting, and, and can you ferment, is it just one item per container, or can you intermingle, let's say, lettuce and cauliflower and broccoli and a, a hodgepodge of things i don't in the think jar. i would ferment lettuce it probably wouldn't hold up to it but you would yeah you can do multiple things so if you want to do like eggplant tomatoes onions and make some sort of fermented mix like that you could certainly do that well, so when we do the fermentation what is some of the biggest mistakes people make besides trying to do too much at once one thing is you're some people don't add enough salt they think Okay, this recipe reads for four cups of salt, I need to add two table or four cups of water, I need to add two tablespoons of salt. That seems awfully high. But that salt acts as a preservation and helps the fermentation process work. If you then in turn when you taste the fermented food and taste too salty, you can certainly rinse it off. That does help. Um, it's something that you have to kind of adjust your taste to. What, what time frame are we looking at? Or is some of this like weeks, months, or, or I mean, I, some of the uh, Asian um, fermentation, they leave them in crocks for like years and decades um, based on, you know, their culture and their education of the fermentation procedure. Well, it really depends on what it is. Okay. If you're doing like a pint jar or something, it could be anywhere from three days to a week. If you're doing a whole crock, that's going to take more time. And crocks can be anywhere from a gallon to what, like 15, 20 gallons? Yeah. The, the big, big crocs. Uh, one, one thing I also want to mention is you are putting these in a, uh, 
environment. Well, an en- environment that consists of you want to be continually about the same temperature, about room temperature. So about 65 to 70 degrees. So not like in the attic or in a, a spare bedroom that's not heated or cooled. Right. Okay. And then you want to keep them away from direct sunlight. Because so a lot of people it can mess the, the, the procedure up inside the jar. A lot of people put... It in, it's, you probably want it to be more like 70 to 75 degrees. But a lot of people put them like on top of their fridge if they don't have direct sunlight there. We keep ours on our counter because the, it doesn't have direct sunlight and it stays pretty consistent with temperature. Now, another problem a lot of people have is they've done all the steps correctly and they've got four or five, six different jars going and they kind of all go bad. Right. So one thing you want to do, especially because you can even do like a sourdough starter, make your own sourdough bread. You can do your own yogurt. Um, it's more of a traditional yogurt, not not the type of yogurt that you would buy in the store. It's a... Uh, it's still good, but it's a different type of yogurt. Another one is milk kefir, which is basically like a yogurt, but it's a dairy product. Now, with some of these, you have to buy what is called a, a starter? You can buy a starter, yes. And then you can keep reusing that starter as well. So you take a portion of the original product, or for kefir, you use the grains, and then you keep reusing them as you make more. But it, it, the the gases that is released can affect other things next to... Definitely. Okay. So if you say you're doing some kefir and you're trying to do some fermented uh, pickles or something, you might want to keep them separate so that they don't affect each other. Because we've had that problem before. We were, what was it, Jerusalem artichoke, uh, uh, fermentation Jerusalem artichokes, and then pickles, and there was something else, and they kind of all went bad at the same time because they were sitting next to one another, and it's just weird that the gases react to one another and mess things up another thing i want to mention is we made our own uh what was with pears but it's essentially the raw apple cider vinegar but we use pears and that's something you can do you can take your pear scraps your apple scraps and you can um ferment them and you can make your own vinegar right and we've done that and now you can't do that with all you can do that with apples and you can do that with pears, and you can do that with pineapple. Yes. But you just can't go any vegetable or fruit, throw it in a jar, and, and do that procedure. It doesn't work that way. Right. It, it is a long procedure. And you're adding sugar, you're adding the original veg- the original fruit. Um, fruit, and then you're letting it sit over time. And it is quite a process. I think it takes like three or four months. Right. And, and based on uh, the jar, the size, all of that that goes along with it. Um, now, with that... It is an incredible procedure. It's, it's fresh. It's so nice to have. I mean, we kind of went crazy last year and made five gallons of uh, <laughs> of pear. Yeah, but we've used it. Right, right. right. We've, we've used it. I mean, not all five gallons, and we've given some away, but we've definitely found uses for it. Right. Um, so you can do that. You can make your own vinegar, but if you're going to use vinegar for canning, you don't want to use the vinegar no. that you started with no. or you, you made. Yeah. So you don't want to use your own homemade vinegar. You definitely want to use store-bought because of the acidity level in the store bought is going to be consistent at the correct consistency that you need as opposed to your own there is a, there is a way if you make your own vinegar through the fermentation process in which you can test to make sure it's right percentage it's just easier to go buy the el cheapo stuff you got uh, at the bottom of the shelf or the the, the cheap stuff um at the store right so uh fermentation it's a procedure now it, it, can, it, it is it work just canning jars and crocs, or is there other devices that can Most be Most people used? just use canning jars and crocs, um, and then you you can buy these little airlock lids so that you can make sure the correct gases escape but keep the, the I guess, the bad things out. Um, some people buy, like, fermentation weights. Or it's recommended to do the gas the airlock. Yeah, I think, if I, I think for me it's been more consistent that way. Right. So, well, if you've never fermented... We encourage you maybe to check that out. We've got a lot of videos on the website for that. When we come back, we're going to talk about a term that many people are not familiar with called hugo culture. We'll explain what that is and will it benefit you on your property right after this. Tweet Joey and Holly using hashtag TWVG. The international food selection at Woodman's is more than just salsa and soy sauce. We stock a huge selection of foods and ingredients from all over the world. Whether it's Asian, Latin American, European, or Middle Eastern, Woodman's has it. Plus, each store has its own unique selection. With Woodman's, you don't need to visit multiple stores to get what you need. We have everything you need under one roof and at a great price. 
Hotch and Mill, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family owned company, continual standards that are non GMO, organic at the highest safety levels, offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed, and more, even kosher and gluten free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information and recipes, visit HodgsonMill.com. That's H O D G S O N M I L L.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, retail manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mills is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your host, Joey and Kelly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX106.5. So happy you've taken a little time out of your Saturday morning to join us on the program. And another thing you can take some time in is appreciating great fresh peaches drove right to the Milwaukee area via a wonderful company called TreeRipe.com. Tree Ripe. If you like fresh produce delivered right to your neighborhood, you should check out Tree Ripe Citrus Company. You can find out where to pick up top quality produce from tree-ripe.com. They have beautiful, tasty peaches, sweet, juicy blueberries. Um, they even have uh, pecans this year. And so if, if you are sick of your bland, milly peaches and lackluster blueberries from your local grocer, Tree Ripe has what you need. They come right to a stop in your neighborhood, fresh off the truck, right from the source. So you can... Find the location schedules at tree-ripe.com. In the winter, they have citrus, uh, grapefruit, some really great uh, other oranges, things like that. They have locations all over, including Iowa, Upper and Lower Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, and right here in Wisconsin. Tree-ripe.com is your go-to for the freshest produce around. And they are still delivering to yes. the Milwaukee area. And, you know, we talk about how great they are and how they're blemish-free and all that. We could talk about them for 20 minutes. It's one of these things you have to experience to appreciate the quality that they put into their produce. They do not, if, if, if it's, if it's a, a questionable peach, they don't put it in the box. Uh, they appreciate their customers, and they appreciate their quality of pr uh, produce that they have. So uh, check them out, tree-ripe.com. Well, Holly, there's a term that is used, and I don't really know what, where the origination of the term came from. But it's called hugel culture. Yes, and it's, it's called hugel culture. And if you're l listening and you're like, I want to Google that, it's spelled H U G E L K U L T U R. So it doesn't. I'm not sure if it's spelled exactly how you would think, but it's. Uh, if you get it close, the the, get close, the search engines will yeah, help you out Google, with that. Google usually will help you out, but um, basically, it's a composting process. Um, and it allow it's taking wood debris and other compostable biomass plant materials, and it helps to improve soil fertility, water retention, soil warming, and it benefits the plant's growth. So what it, what essentially what it is, it's a giant mound, and there's two different ways in which you can build this mound. You can um, dig a ditch and put wood in it, and uh, then, um, then you can go about that way, but before we go in more in depth, we'll go to the ivyorganics.com hotline. We do have a question uh, f uh, on the program. You have a question? Actually, I have a comment. All right, go right ahead. Wonderful. Well, the first thing I wanted to do was to say thank you so much for your show. Um, I am Lena Taylor. I'm State Senator Lena Taylor, and I am just so excited that your show exists. Uh, the second thing I wanted to do was invite you to the table to help me say to our Workforce Investment Board that we need to have agriculture 
as one of the sectors so that individuals who are doing the things that you're speaking of have an opportunity to go to the Workforce Investment Board for support for um, the area that they're working in and that when you're training people in these areas that you'd also be eligible for training dollars and, and workforce training dollars. And so I wanted to invite you to the table and to that agriculture summit that would help people to be a little more literate about what is available for us in urban agriculture and what our possibilities are. Well, we, we appreciate you uh, calling in, Ms. Taylor. And um, if you could give some contact information uh, to uh, Mr. Homer so that he can take that so we can get in contact with you. Wonderful. My number, my number is 342. <laughs> All right. Seven give, me, one. give me one second here. We got to grab a pen real quick. No worries. And while you're grabbing a pen, I look forward to when we get together telling you about the love and faith model. Right. Um, and I'd like you to go with me to visit um, to a place that's called Riverview Garden. It is exactly like the Love and Faith model, except it's missing a couple pieces, but it has the, the most of any model that I've seen, it has the most of Love and Faith. And in particular, it uses workforce and it uses agriculture as a vehicle for entrepreneurism, worker training, and healing. It, it's amazing. Well, that's, that sounds fantastic. We're definitely interested in learning more. And what was your number, Ms. Taylor? Three four two, seven one, seven six. All right. Well, we'll definitely be giving you a call um, and getting in contact with you to uh, work together. Well, I look forward to it. I appreciate it, and I appreciate something other than the Farm Bureau that is at three or four a.m. You know, on a Sunday that I can enjoy you on a Saturday. So, thank you so much, and have a great day. Well, thank you for listening. You have a great day. Uh, always positive to hear wonderful feedback like that uh, about our program, the work that we've put into it to educate uh, those who are interested but just do not have a source to learn about gardening and uh, growing their own food. Definitely. So hugel culture, there's a couple of different ways uh, uh, to develop a hugel culture bed. You can simply take logs and limbs at the base, just on regular ground, put them there, and then throw yard debris, biodegradable debris on that, and then you can mound it, put, put dirt on top of it. So there is some work that goes into it. Or you can actually dig a trench, layer your wood in that trench, put your debris on top of it, and then mound it. Now, these mounds can be as big or as small. There is Hugel culture mounds that are 20 feet tall. Right. And you can plant on these mounds. The, 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 the ideal behind it, and it works, is as the rain and nature and all that stuff the, breaks down the wood at the base, that wood acts as a sponge. And it releases, it wicks water out of that wood into the soil, which feeds the plants that you're growing. Now, this doesn't have to be radishes and cucumbers and peppers. This can be trees. This can be uh, blueberries or blackberries or everbearing or, or perennials. It doesn't have to be a, a, a annual vegetable. It's something that just happens in nature anyway, basically. They're, they're, if you do this in your yard or wherever, you're basically mimicking what's happening. If you were to walk through the forest, you'd... You see this happening, but you don't realize it's happening, basically. And so what happens is that the good thing about this is it, re it retains rainwater incredibly well, which is good for your plants. It's similar to swells, if you're familiar with that. It, it captures the water that's running and holds it, allows it to soak in, and then uses it when it's needed. It's, right. just, it's not just runoff. Yeah, so it, it, does, it does that. It, it retains the rainwater. Also, a lot of times in the fall... You're taking your branches and your leaves and whatnot, and you're putting them on the side of the curb. You can, re in turn, take those items, and you can make your own hugel culture situation so that you can uh, have a beneficial ecosystem in your garden, and it helps, it helps reduce weeds as well, so less weeding because of the, um, the way it's set up. And also, you don't have to worry about tilling because of this natural process. Now, it doesn't have to be. I, I mentioned about some of these hugel culture beds are 20 foot tall. You can, there's no right or wrong dimensions to make a hugel culture bed as long as you have all the ingredients 
to make it. It can be two foot wide by six foot long, and it can be just part of the inner uh, portions of your garden, or you can go to a very large extreme and make it very tall and long and, and, and put a lot of effort into it. When you make a hugel culture bed on a grand scheme, it's much easier if you have industrial equipment like front loaders and back hose to dig and make this firm, you know, uh, uh, correct uh, with the the, um, the correct amount of material. Some of these uh, people in um, areas in which they live in the country, they can uh, they, they will do that and make very long, you know, hundred foot, two hundred foot hugel culture beds. And with that. Um, it can we always talk about soil nutrients nutrients in your soil how important how important that is adding compost adding fertilizer or whatnot um this will this can attend, uh, that does it all essentially yeah for up to 20 years depending on the size obviously can the plants can live off it for 20 years without having to add any additional nutrients now when you add your wood uh items there are some wood that you do not want to put at the base because there are some woods in nature that doesn't work for this because they don't break down cedar is one of them black locust is another one black cherry and black walnut these trees do not break down like a uh, like maples and oaks and uh, other uh, trees like that so those are some no-nos to put in the bottom of your hugel culture because it won't absorb the water it won't break down and it's, it's just a it's not going to work well you're going to put a lot of effort into it and it's not going to work um what other things do we need to know about hugo culture holly that will uh, help us in our developmental stage here of building one if you have rotting wood so say that you have you just happen to have some rotting wood or a the, tree that needs to come down yeah, sitting in the corner of your property or something like that that the process has already started with that, so that is one thing that you can do. Wood chips can be used, but it's a kind of a different, whole different ball of wax there. That's more of the back to eating gardening, but that is possible. Um, so if you've got rotting wood, you can do some wood chips, but like complete wood is what you want. You also want to keep in mind that you want to get the most best amount of sunlight. So if you keep this bed running north to south, and so that the east to west sun can hit it that's what's ideal or or based on where you're at if you're in milwaukee or somewhere else in the world listening to this on a replay you angle it to where the sun can get both sides of your bed that's why you want to run north the bed to run north right. to south so that the east to west sun can right and and then in the spring you know or later in the fall a lot of the cold winds come from the north well they do come from the north so if you're trying to extend your uh, growing cycle if you're doing annuals like vegetables you can plant just strictly on that south side that wind blocks the the vegetables and the and and the soil warms from the south so that's something you can kind of keep in mind as well well another thing you want to keep in mind is mowing grass and if you don't have a good piece of equipment it's not a, not fun you don't have a good looking lawn and uh, Aaron's can help you out with that. Do you hear that? That's your neighbor shaking in their grass stained shoes because Aaron's is about to help you step up your grass cutting game. Your name is on the mailbox so the Aaron's name should be on your mower. Heavy duty steel construction, smarter smoother controls, professional cutting performance. The only thing we love more than the smell of freshly cut grass is a sweet taste of victory. Aaron's it comes down to this. Visit Aaron's.com to find your local dealer for lawn and snow removal equipment. When we come back right after this. Have a gardening question? Email Joey and Holly at twvgradio at gmail.com. Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala Kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at greenstockgarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water-saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. Greenstockgarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. 
proudly made in the USA. For more information and to purchase, visit GreenStockGarden.com. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh loose carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available, open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 and online at beansandbarley.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from plantsuccess.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and a healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponics, root cutting, seed sprouting, coca core, and soil. Plantsuccess.com carries powdered granule and tablet forms of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil for your plants to give them the optimal opportunity to produce an incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit plantsuccess.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your host, Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM, WNOV, and W293CX 106.5. So happy you've joined us today. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination for all things gardening, now containing over 1,000 garden videos, short and long format, to help you grow more of what you enjoy to eat and want to try to eat. Well, we will be at the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center, this Thursday at 6 p.m., where you, Holly, will be doing a basics of canning class. Now, I want people to understand that it's not you're going to do a whole we're going to make pickles type of thing. You're going over the understanding of how canning works. Right. That's exactly it. I talk about uh, this, this, the safety of canning, how to, the, the ideas behind canning, what you may need to get started canning. I answer people's canning, canning questions, and um, we talk about, we, do, we don't do a demonstration, but we talk about kind of the idea behind uh, water bath canning and the steps to get there, and then we talk about the importance of what you can can in a water bath canner versus a pressure canner. Uh, and, and the do's and the don'ts and the, the science behind it. Well, uh, Blue Mel's has a lot of products, so you can go there early. You can stay a little late. They, they're, uh, and they have, a, they have a knowledgeable staff, mm-hmm. very knowledgeable staff. So if you have any questions, they can definitely help you. They have a um, wide variety of plants. So if you want something, especially now for fall, they'll have things there or soon. Um, bulbs, I'm sure they've got those going on. And then um, anything you need for your garden, essentially. Uh, yeah, where can we find Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center? We can find Blue Mills at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield. They're just south of Layton on Loomis. And at bluemills.com or call 414-282-4220. Uh, we did have a number of questions come in this week, and we can go over uh, those. Uh, Holly, we asked a question last week. Uh, and if you've got a question, you, you can call in right now as well at, at on the ivyorganics.com hotline at 414-444-5250. And uh, we had a question last week that uh, I kind of caught you off guard with, which was, can you safely use Splenda when canning instead as, as a substitute as regular granular sugar? Yes. So you can, but it has to be Splenda. It cannot be um, equal or sugar twin or anything else. So it would have to be specifically Splenda because that has been scientifically proven to use and be safe in canning. Now, we don't use the, the granular sugar that you buy in the five-pound bag, the, the, what is considered white sugar or GMO sugar. Right. Uh, what do we, we use a different type of sugar that works just as good. Well, it's just the same as sugar, right. but it's an organic cane sugar. So it's not made with the sugar beet. And uh, the sugar beet is, is fully genetically modified. And the sugar that you buy in the store, if you go to your local stop and shop there, wherever you go, <laughs> and you go to the baking aisle and you just pick up your five-pound bag of sugar, two-pound bag of sugar, what have you, that is made with the genetically modified sugar beet. So we choose, um, personally, this is our decision, to purchase the organic cane sugar. Uh, and you can't tell the difference. Uh, I think it's a little sweeter. 
Uh, I can't tell the difference. Okay. You can't tell the difference. No, and it works just the same. Right. So, but just keep that in mind that if you are going to use a sugar substitute, you can use Splenda. And I also asked, um, I asked Christina Ward, she's the master food preserver for Milwaukee County. I asked her about Stevia because Stevia is very popular these days. I use uh, Stevia or some people call it Stevia, however you say it. I use that um, as a sweetener occasionally too. And that's not been proven yet to safely can with. So if you need a sugar alternative, you would want to go with the Splenda. Right. Uh, so there you go. Um, and and Christine has been a guest on the program yes. uh, this year, uh, a couple of weeks ago. What's another question that we had? Um, uh, that we had. Uh, oh, uh, when you. Uh, oh, why is it bad to harvest prior to a, a heat wave? Okay. Uh, the and are you talking about uh, the fruits specifically, or like say like something like lettuce? Um, or like Swiss chard or kale, like the uh, like maybe a fruiting plant versus like a green plant. Uh, it's not bad to harvest. That was a misunderstanding we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, dealing six ways to deal with stress, uh, uh, keeping your garden stress free. You can harvest before a heat wave, and you can do either the the greens or the fruit or the vegetable or the whatever it is, and you can go ahead and do that prior to the heat wave because that's going to lessen the stress on your plant. A plant will spend three to four times more energy keeping a item on the plant, on the healthy and per, uh, alive than if you just remove it from the actual plant. So you can do that prior to a heat wave and uh, your plants are going to be much, much happier with you. Definitely. Um, so if you do have a question, I don't know if Mr. Finley is going to call in. So if you got a question, we um, you can definitely call us at 414-444-5250. Um, so another question we had come in this week was, when you use boxes for mulch and lay them flat, do you need to remove the glue that's used to glue the flaps together? And we, uh, just to clarify here, what we did is, we, um, next to our straw bale garden bed, we took some cardboard and used it as mulch to suppress the weeds, um, and then the plants grew on top of that, and it worked It worked really well, so that's definitely something that we'll be doing again, but um, do you have to have, remove that glue? We don't remove the glue because it's kind of uh, difficult to remove the glue because remember the cardboard boxes have a three-layer system most time. They have an outer layer, an inner layer, and then a ribbed layer in between, which that's all sandwiched with glue. What we did do was removed all the labels and the tape that was used to put the boxes together because that's not going to break down. The glue will break down. There is a tiny bit of toxicity to whatever degree, but uh, compared to what we congest in a normal day, that's nothing. That The soil will fix that as it breaks down. Uh, so that works very well. Now, again, we did that by the straw bale garden. What we will do uh, additionally this year is each year in the fall, we take the leaves from the street and the property and mound on all of our grow beds. What we're going to do and what worked last year in that straw in that experiment there was we're going to take cardboard and lay on the soil itself regardless we'll get the vegetables out if there's weeds there that's fine we'll lay the cardboard on the soil smash what weeds are there and then mound on top of that and that will smother those weeds out come next spring we'll just rake back the leaves dig a hole cut a little hole out of the cardboard plant there and what we've seen with what we did last year it worked very well what weeds occur or grow are on top of the cardboard where we can just simply pull them up it works very well so we will do that but yeah just remove the tape and the labels the glue you're not going don't worry about it, it it's fine but tapes and labels uh, is what you need to do all right so another question we actually had this and we're i'm sure we're going to do talk on or we're going to talk about starting garlic planting garlic at some point soon here but we had a question asked when we were at the state fair yesterday um about how how far you should space your garlic apart when you plant it it really depends on if you've been doing something for 20 years and it's been working successfully for you continue to do that if you're new at gardening um, there's a lot of recommendations on the internet and we know not everything is 100 percent correct we always space our garlic about 8 to 10 inches apart because garlic gets very tall. It has leaves that branch out that needs to not be crowded. So we will plant our cloves no closer than 8 inches apart. Some people will squeeze them 6 inches. That's fine if it works for you. The rows separating those, the spacing between the rows, no closer than a foot apart uh, will be what is needed for that uh, because... It, uh, you need the space for the, the plants to do its thing. So eight inches uh, per plant and 
spacing row to row one foot. So you can intensely plant. That's what we do. That's why we go eight inches. Some places say 12 inches is recommended, but uh, it really depends on um, uh, on that. Another question we had, can I use a stock pot for canning rather than a water bath traditional canner? Um, yeah, yes and no. It depends on what the depth of that stock pot is. So whenever, whatever you're canning, whether it be quart jars, pint jars, half pint jars, you want to have about two inches of water above those jars when they're in. When at they're the submerged. beginning. Yeah. At the beginning. Yes, at the beginning. So keeping that in mind, um, you need to think about that. You need to think about that stock pot. If you're just canning some short jelly jars, most stock pots would work. But then you also need to have something between the bottom of the pots and the bottom of the jars. So we've used old butter knives. You could take old canning rings and wire them together and make a little rack, but you don't want the bottom of those jars touching the bottom of that stock pot. So that's two things to keep in mind. Um, you need, a fool needs a lid, and then you also need to have, t or that's three things. So it needs a lid. You need to have about two inches of water above those jars, and you need something between the jars and the bottom of the pot. And another question we had was, can or will a glass top stove work with a traditional canner? Well, because, because a lot of people have these new age stoves that don't have the traditional coil or the burners that we're familiar with as growing up. Right, and I don't, I don't know much about induction heating, so that's something that you would have to, if you're looking to invest in that, that's something you would have to do some research on because most canners that you buy are beveled at the bottom. And I believe with the induction heating uh, for the stove, it has to make a direct contact. So the, the stock pot, pot. Yeah, the pot. The, no, I mean, the, if, if we go back to the previous question, the stock pot. Yeah, the stock pot would work because most of the time sp stock pots are flat. But if you're using a canner, those are beveled. So if you have induction heating, it's not going to make it's not going to make direct contact. Now, if you have a, just a regular glass top stove, the problem is, is a lot of times it's the weight of the canner. The weight of the canner not itself, but when it has water and the jars in it, it could be problematic because of that glass. It might be too much weight. Uh, and we've heard horror stories that uh, have come across our canning page where it has cracked the stove top in half. Right, and, and I, I'm sure maybe these things are better now. It looks like it was <laughs> an older stove. But if you say you have a glass top and you're unsure, you could always find a cheap solution and buy one of those uh, hot plate type coil things maybe not necessarily a hot plate i don't know really what you call them but it's like a coil burner that you could use separately um to can with uh another question we had before we go to break is do you shade your cucumbers and uh, we've chose not to shade our cucumbers uh typically a plant such as cucumbers or melons or squashes have very broad leaves to protect the fruit that is underneath it from the sun. Those are, uh, if, you, if you're looking at plants and they have a very wide leaf, they're typically known as a full sun plant. That's kind of a uh, unwritten rule uh, that, that gardeners can see to protect the fruit. In, in cr incredible cases, such as like, you know, if you're in South Texas or Southern California or somewhere where it's like next to the sun, you'd want to uh, shade them, do, do a, like a shade cloth to protect them because of that intensity of heat. Well, when we come back, we'll answer more of your garden questions and more of our garden answers right after this. gardening question, you can call into the ivorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250 right now. The River West Co-op Grocery and Cafe is proud to support the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener and a lot of other Wisconsin growers as well. The Co-op offers a wide range of local and organic produce in their store and on their cafe menu. From apples to yogurt and everything in between. Open 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekdays, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekends at the corner of Clark and Frackney in Milwaukee's River West neighborhood. See what is in store and check out the Co-op Cafe delicious vegetarian menu at riverwestcoop.org garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune just 99 cents at migardener.com with over 300 varieties of non-gmo heirloom and organic flower vegetable and herb seeds available year round pay less and get more seeds shipping as low as two dollars and fifty cents 
That just makes sense. Go to MIGardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools and special blend fertilizer. MIGardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bob X is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants, will not wash off, and is guaranteed. Bob X deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bob X can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more visit bobex.com b-o-b-b-e-x dot c-o-m i want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs i want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community all i want is a garden center that truly values their customers it seems like everyone is selling plants these days but i'm having a hard time finding quality i take pride in my garden so i want my garden center to take pride in their products where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season blue mel's garden center we are your answer. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. And you're absolutely right about the tomatoes. Next to a very good woman, tomatoes come in a close second. With your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. So happy you've joined us. That was from our conversation from um, the Wisconsin Foodie right. a couple weeks ago. Yep. Um, Kyle Church. There you go. Mm-hmm. You can find that and all previous episodes under the radio tab uh, at the website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, in full linked in studio video and podcast form as well as highlights on the uh, right hand side of the page well if you have a question on the uh if you have a garden question or comment or comment you can call into the ivyorganics.com three in one plant guard hotline and holly how do we do that and what is ivy organics ivy organic is a three in one plant guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn insects and rodents protects newly installed plants and trees shields print and damaged surfaces for use on your roses Fruit and nut trees are ornamental trees and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. You can call on to 414-444-5250. So, yeah, call on 414-444-5250. So it turns out our guest did not appear today, which it happens. Um, so we are... Uh, we like to prepare questions, but we're kind of low on questions. So <laughs> just being honest with you here. But a lot of people ask us how we got into this. Okay. How we got a radio show and I guess um, everything that we do. So we can tell as much as we can tell because there is some things we have to. Right. It's confidential. But well, let's start from the beginning. Okay. Um, I grew up in the city. I grew up in West Dallas and Joey grew up on a farm in southern Illinois. And when you think of southern Illinois, I think... There south, is some, yeah, there's something south, be- yeah, something south of sh- Chicago yeah. and even yet south of Springfield. Um, just a lot of farms and small towns, basically. Right. 69% of residents in the state of Illinois can look out their back door and see what once was called the Sears Tower. So that's how many people's in Chicago. There's a lot of people south of Chicago. But anyway, that's go right. ahead. Yeah. Okay. So this is that's our, our background together. Now, I grew up, even though I grew up in the city, we had a small garden. We had a compost pile. So I was familiar with the um, the idea of, of growing food. Joey understood growing food on a much larger scale and a little bit more. Uh, 500, uh, 300 head of cattle, 2,000 hogs, and about 1,000 tillable acres is where I came from. Right. So just... If, wrap that around your head for a moment there so i had um, moved to st louis for a job transfer and that's where i had met joey he grew up about an hour hour and a half southwest southeast of st louis and so we had met and then in 2009 we uh, mid 2009 we decided to move back to wisconsin and or i decided to move back to wisconsin joey came with and in 2000 nine-ish we decided to well we came back in 2009 so 2010 right we decided to start a website or a a facebook page for wisconsin vegetable gardeners which is where our name came from and because we just noticed that there wasn't a lot of uh midwest based facebook pages uh for garden for vegetable gardeners and then that following spring no fall 
mm-hmm. I want a video camera at work. Yeah. And Joey's like, what are we going to do with the video camera? I'm like, we're going to make gardening videos. So you can find our first gardening video. And they are bad. They are bad. <laughs> but you can find them, and yep. then you can see how much things have changed. A, a thousand videos later. Yeah, and um, then we established the website, um, and then eventually... And, and Holly and I have no, I, I have a, 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 a little bit of a degree in photography. And Ho- I have a degree in uh, graphic and print communication and also a bachelor's degree in, in ecology. Or but we didn't science. go to school to say, no. oh, how do we make YouTube videos? This was all, you know, people like Joe Lampo we got a hold of, uh, Mike Novak, Doug Oster, all these bigger individuals in the industry and said, hey, here's what we're doing. And they said, here's what you're doing wrong. Here's what you need to start doing and stop doing. And, and, and a lot of people in the gardening world is very helpful with one another and, and because they all want the message to be shared. Right. So this is, um, that's, that's how we got started. We, it kind of, it literally was a grass, grassroots type of situation, just uh, the two of us. And we learned how to reach out to sponsors uh, for our website and our videos. And then let's see. Oh, I want to admit this failure. Um, in 2015, we contacted WNOV for, you know, to get information to get a radio show. We, we reached out to sponsors, but we reached out to sponsors kind of, I don't want to say the wrong way, but I guess it probably was the wrong way. And we crashed and burned. And so then mm-hmm. <laughs> in 2016, we're like, we're going to give this a shot again. And luckily that WNOV was uh, very grateful to reach out to, to uh, agree to, uh, agree yeah. to, um, allow, to, us, like, to allow us to have the opportunity again. And we contacted some of our friends in the gardening radio show business and especially Mr. Mike Novak. And they kind of, they didn't tell us what to do, but they gave us like, here's, here's some how and, we have done it. Here's some do's and don'ts. Yeah. And, Obviously, we made it happen. Yeah, and we're working very hard to come back next year. Uh, won't give too much information, but we're ju- about quarter of the way funded for next year, and we're just in August. So, right. Um, but yeah, it was a very well. Once you become established and you have something, then people credible. are more willing. Yeah, you're yeah. more credible, and people are more willing to give you some money. Um, but you know, there's there's that commercial. I, I think it's for the NFL. There, the comment is, you don't know how to do something until you failed at it the first time. Right, and I I want to I wanted to bring that up because we. You know, while we are very, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to not lie and say we're good at what we do. At the same time, we've made a lot of mistakes and learned many things along the way. Um, and that's in anything we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're not afraid to admit that. Right. Uh, I do want to get to the uh, last question on our uh, sheet there that came in last night. Now, we have people that listen to our program, not only in, in Milwaukee, but all over the United States. I know there's uh, a couple of people in New York, northern Wisconsin, southern California that listen to our program. Um, and we do have a question. Before we get to that question, we do have a question on the IVOrganics.com hotline. Uh, caller, you have a question or comment? Yes, I do. Uh, I heard you mention something about cardboard and gardening. Um, I worked in a cardboard factory, and uh, all cardboard that is made has formaldehyde in it. So would that have anything to do with going into the ground? Formaldehyde is, if I'm correct, uh Sir and Holly, though that's used as part of the embalming process for... That's cardboard. correct. Oh, okay. Right. Um, yeah, that... It, at least, like, is it a large, large percentage or just a microscopic percentage of formaldehyde that is used in the the box making procedure? Every time each box, it comes off, it comes off the corrugator. You have to put formaldehyde in all cardboard so that it doesn't rot. Okay. That's why. That's why I was uh, speaking what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people know that, but all cardboard. TVs, refrigerators, bed frames, everything gets formaldehyde in it so that the cardboard don't rot. Well, we definitely appreciate you telling us that. Okay. And uh, no, it's it's we, they, we they, learn from we, you as much as yeah, you we learn, learn from, from us. Yeah. You. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely something that people want to consider before they put the cardboard in their garden going forward. Okay. Then. But thank you. Thank Have you very nice much one. for the information. Yeah, and, and it's not just we're here and we know everything because we don't know everything. Just like that caller, we are now informed that formaldehyde is placed in boxes and a lot of other products um, before they go and we use them for a number of procedures uh, and, and, and items. So, uh, and that's that's what we like. You know, it's not just one-sided. We like to hear from you and, and learn from you as well. Um, okay, so uh, your so question was yeah. after harvesting seeds, 
onion that appear, seeds. Uh, or onion seeds. They appear to be dry now. Can I plant them right away for another crop? They're in, and this person's in Southern California. Yeah, and, and we have listeners from all over. Uh, they listen to it live. They listen to the podcast replay. They listen to the in-studio video uh, replay. And yes, you can. Once, if you're in a mild climate like Southern California, you can use those seeds after they've dried and replant them. What you want to do here in Wisconsin, save the seeds, dry them, keep them in a uh, dry envelope, Save them and plant them in the in the fall or uh, in the spring, and you're good to go. Uh, we have another question on the ivyorganics.com hotline. You have a question or comment? Yes, I have put it on the website, but uh, I'm just calling to find out with my potatoes, whether they're red or white potatoes, the tops, you know, the plant part yes. dies before the potatoes have completed form, and maybe one or two potatoes, and you can see where there are several more that are just barely starting, but they never develop before the tops die. And no evidence uh, can be seen of any type of uh, pest or any, any uh, infestation. It's just as if they mature, I don't know, too quickly and then die off. Do you have any comments about that? Um, it could be, uh, at times, it could be a lack of nutrients in the soil. If the potatoes don't, if any plant doesn't have a lot, enough nutrients, it's not. they're not going to grow as well as they should. It could also be something like early blight. Early blight could affect. So if you ever, if it could be early blight on your potatoes too, because early blight often looks like the plant is dying, which means that you want to harvest it. But it could be the early blight causing that problem. And early blight is a bad bacteria that splashes up from the soil onto the plant, and tomatoes are su uh, susceptible to this as well. No, pota yes, potatoes. Oh, you said tomatoes are in addition to potatoes. That right. is correct. They're both okay. in the same family. Oh. Okay. Yeah. A uh, couple of things you can do uh, for next year is, or if you plant fall potatoes, is mulch heavily with dry, chemical-free, seed-free grass clippings or straw, shredded paper, something to put a barrier between the ground and the plant. Oh, okay. You can also use whole grain yellow cornmeal. We recommend Hotchins Mills because they're a sponsor of the program. But what that yellow whole grain cornmeal has in it is a beneficial bacteria called trichoderma that fights against the bad bacteria, which is the early blight in your soil. And it doesn't eliminate it, but it reduces it by every bit of 80%. So in combination with the mulch and the whole grain cornmeal, your early blight will almost be non-existent. Okay. I'll try that. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for, for listening calling. and listening to the program. Uh, and, you know, uh, back to my onion thing there. Uh, we, you, onions are only good. See, onion seeds are only really good for one year. Parsnips are the same way. Uh, leeks are the same way. So if you save your onion seeds now, if you let them go to seed, onions are biannual. They take two years. So they grow this year. If you leave them alone, they'll come back next year and put this giant seed pod on and they'll have hundreds and if not thousands of seeds. Then you can take those seeds and plant them the following well, we start about the second week in January from seed, and then we plant them out, and we've had phenomenal onions, and you'll be able to see that on the video uh, next, uh, not t this Tuesday, a week from now. Uh, but you want to use them in an hour, uh, in a year time, because they will lose viability very, very uh, strongly. Well, we appreciate you tuning into the program, and the sponsors are what makes this program uh, so possible, and we appreciate your support to the program and to our sponsors, just like... Nasala Kombucha, executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocery. If you don't see it, ask for it, because if it's not Nasala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. You can find it more at nasala.com. Coming up, program note, next week we are going to talk about eight things that you should be doing with your old grass clippings that you're not doing that are chemical-free and seed-free grass clippings, as well as the history of that famous blue canning jar from Ball. Do you really know the whole story? As well as Milwaukee's own Will Allen should be here with us, and we'll talk about growing power and uh, how that all began miss any portion of this program or want to revisit it in its entirety you can find that underneath the radio tab on the website the wisconsin vegetable gardener.com want a specific topic or individual interview find that underneath the highlight tab on the right hand side of the main page for holly baird i'm joy baird and until next week we will see you in the garden mm -hmm.